Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another HIDMED Chats and our Do No Harm series. I'm uh, Dr. Nisi Hudson. I'm the chair of HIDMED Initiative. And I'm Jonathan White, co-founder and director of policy. Um, Hood Medicine is a, a nonprofit public health collective of um, scientists, physicians, hackers, and other assorted geeks who are dedicated to protecting black and brown lives. Hood Med Chats, our signature event, is an effort to bring the expertise of healthcare professionals and others to black and brown communities. Our goal is very simple, help us, save us. We are super excited tonight because we have an all gorilla chat. Um, we have our Director of Public Health Advocacy, Jen Mohammed, and one of our advisory board members, John Chanel. Nice to have you guys on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, John is the Director of Anti-Racism Initiatives for the Office of Undergraduate Medical Education at the University of Louisville School of Medicine, my alma mater. <laughs> uh, he has a Master of Laboratory, Library and Information Science from the University of Kentucky. And then he has an MA and a PhD in Pan-African Studies from the University of Louisville. Um, he's um, also an accomplished poet, playwright, and was nominated for an Emmy Award for appending the script for Young Men Grow Older. Um, and he advises on medical education, the history of medical racism and health advocacy initiatives for hood medicine. <laughs> Tonight is a very lucky night. We have three Course 7 uh, alumni from MIT on this call. Uh, Jennifer Mohammed has a um, bachelor's degree in biology from MIT and a master's of arts and a master's of science in health advocacy and human genetics from the Sarah Lawrence, Lawrence College. Uh, she works as a genetic counselor at Integrated Genetics uh, Lab Corps. Her efforts are focused on engagement in underserved communities to advocate for science and health education and preventative medicine. Welcome. So, yeah, so happy to have you guys here. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you for that introduction, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so, John, I thought maybe we would start with you and you could give us a little bit of context and talk about like your work researching the history of medical racism and um, sort of the foundations of of the biases that we see manifest today. Okay, so my, my particular um, research in this area came about through the confluence of two different jobs in the university, as a medical librarian and as a adjunct faculty member in the Department of Pan-African Studies. And so I kind of merged a lot of the research tracks that were separate into one sort of one stream, which was to look at uh, the history of um, the social construction of race in relation to medicine and in relation to slavery. And what, what comes out of that for me is a, a, a profound sort of uh, understanding of the, of the role of physicians in the invention of race and the invention and, and uh, establishment of uh, scientific racism in this country. So, but before getting into some of the context around that, uh, I'd like to start out by just simply talking about the context of our experience in this country, which shapes all of that, which, which is a reflection of, of all of the things that have happened in terms of enslavement, the healthcare disparities that we're experiencing, et cetera. So we, we've been in North America under the British colony system since, uh, uh, 16, uh, 19. Now, I, I make a distinction here because Africans had been in North America a century before, having come in with Spanish uh, explorers and conquistadors. So our presence predates the English colony of Jamestown. But generally, the history that most of us are familiar with in this country, given its very narrow focus, had, begins with Jamestown. So when we look back 402 years to uh, our arrival in 1619, and we look at the history of enslavement, which ends in uh, 1865, we're talking about 246 years of, the, of our time in this country. And that's 61% of the time that African-Americans have been in North America under US and British uh, rule. Uh, so slavery, 62% of our, our historical experience. 
That's followed by American apartheid. And I dated as really beginning in 1865. Some people push it back to reconstruction, but immediately after emancipation, the Southern states began to pass what were called black codes, which, was, which were a set of laws which essentially put African Americans right back into chattel bondage through various means. So American apartheid or Jim Crow, it, I, I, scheduled, I, I basically uh, put the date range for that from 1865 to 1965. That's another 100 years. That's another 25% of our time here in this uh, country. And so now we're talking about 86% of the time that African Americans have been in the United States has been in bondage and in pseudo bondage in terms of American apartheid. Now, there's, a, there's the modern civil rights era, which I look at from 1965 with the Voting Rights Act to 1975. And that's a, just a 10 year window of time. Within that 10 year window of time, we did have, and a little bit prior to that, we had some civil rights bills passed. Uh, however, by 75, there's a real rollback of that little incremental improvement that, that, that took place. And that begins through the war on drugs, the beginning of the prison industrial complex. And as we see now, that rollback has continued. So now all the voting rights gains that were made in that little 10 year window are being rolled back, massively rolled back on the state level. So that era I describe, and which is our present era, as the new Jim Crow period. And that, that encompasses from 1970, 1975 to the present, another 46 years. So there are 10 years out of 402 years where there was a, a window of hope that we would actually um, have a fair, equitable society, that social justice would finally emerge in this country, and none of that's happened. So, so where are we at this stage after 402 years of this, of this experience? Well, one thing that is so clear in looking back at our history is clear, uh, although the data is inadequate or incomplete, that that 402, period, that 402 year period of history is not really a lived experience in this country. It's an experience of death and dying. Death and dying at a level that um, on an annual basis is equivalent to an epidemic happening in the African-American community every single year. Not even considering COVID or flu or influenza or any of those other things, African-Americans are dying at excessive rates every single year. So we have to ask our, ourselves, why is that uh, occurring? So if you just look at the media and look how our health disparities are portrayed, if you look at data and statistics, the, the immediate impression that, that, that is sort of given from that, or that you might even interpret from that, is that there's something wrong with Black people. That Black people are dying at excessive rates from heart disease, kidney disease, cancers, diabetes, etc., compared to most other populations. So there must be something wrong with Black people. And then the other correlation to that is Black lifestyles. So Black culture, <clears throat> something about the way Black people live, raise their children, go through their lives. Um, uh, but in essence, something about Black people physiologically speaking, because of this, this extreme um, situation of excess deaths and premature deaths. So let, let me put those a little bit in context and, and, and stop me at any point if I if I run on a little bit too long with this. We're not uh, likely to. Okay. So let's just talk about the fact that infant mortality remains more than twice as high for, after, for Black infants as for white infants. So if we look at that within a historical context, let's say we go back to 1860, right before the end of, of, of enslavement. And if we look at what little data we have on Black and white infant mortality, we'll see that Black infants and white infants died at about the same very high rates because the lack of medical care, prenatal care is pretty much non-existent in many instances, the inability to treat basic kinds of uh, illnesses or proper sanitation, et cetera, with childbirth and deliveries that could cause infections. Lockjaw was a big problem as a result of those things. So when we look back in time, we see somewhat of, of an equal situation. I will say that uh, Black infants fared as well, 
but certainly the gap between them was not as it is today by no means. So what happens in the course of time between 1860 and today? Well, we get modern medicine, particularly after the Civil War. We get microbiology. We get, um, you know, laboratory medicine, which transforms medical uh, science. And so what we see happening is as medicine modernizes and improves, the mortality and morbidity rates of white Americans decline. Now, there's some minor declines in African-American population due to uh, improved sanitation in cities, for example. You know, att attending to some basic kinds of things of just cleaning up the environment, that helps, right? But in, in actuality, when we see the passage of time, we see greater access to healthcare, improved healthcare, but not for African-Americans. So currently, African-American infants are dying at twice the rate um, as uh, white infants. And those who are delivered by white doctors, a recent study shows, uh, have a 30 or 40 percent greater risk of death than if they were delivered by African-American physicians. That's another uh, thing altogether. So maternal mortality is more than three times higher for black mothers than white mothers. Now what's interesting about that is when we compare people on the basis of socioeconomic status, um, African-American women with the highest socioeconomic indices, the best level of education, highest level of education and economics, have a higher infant mortality rate than white women who have no high school education and are living below the poverty line. So again, the, the, the inference is, well, there's something wrong with black mothers. Clearly, if, if poor white women who have less access to health care than, than, say, normal um, uh, may not have health insurance, et cetera, et cetera, but they're still uh, uh, having a better outcome in terms of births than African-American women who can avail themselves of better medical care, et cetera, then there, there's something clearly amiss there. Homicide is the leading cause of death for Black males of the age 15 to 24 and accounts for half of all deaths for that group compared to 8% of deaths among white males aged 15 to 24. So the lesson from that is, well, black people kill each other and they kill each other at excessive numbers. When you have numbers and data, numbers do not interpret themselves. So there has to be a context and we have to talk about why these numbers are skewed in the way they are, which I'll come to. So, you know, the disparities that we see go way beyond homicide statistics and they can be seen for every leading cause of death. There are excess black deaths in cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, et cetera. The leading causes of death, African-Americans, in many cases, uh, Latinos and Native Americans, far more so than Asian-Americans, have very, very have ex excess deaths compared to white Americans. And by excess deaths, we're saying that if healthcare, education, living circumstances were equal, then life expectancy should be equal across the board mm -hmm. because there's no real distinction between an African-American, a white American, Asian American, or a Native American, physiologically speaking, physically speaking. You know, there's no uh, biological basis to race, so that's not a determinative of some particular difference that would cause this, these excess deaths. What's lacking is access to health care, health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, as we go along. So Dr. These, no, sure. um, we go on. I wanted to pull Jen in on this because as you talk about um, lack of access to health care, um, Jen, your background is in health advocacy. Yeah. How have you uh, interfaced with patients who are encountering issues with um, you know, lack of access and how do you help them along you know, through the work that you're doing? So it's interesting because I do you know, see quite a few patients who either are un or underinsured. And um, it becomes very difficult because there are times where there is a certain medical test, in my case in particular, a genetic test, because I'm a genetic counselor, that I really think would be beneficial to the, to the patient to have, but they just don't have the money or Medicaid won't pay for it because you have to understand that a lot of these decisions aren't so much 
patient or doctor driven, they're also, um, they're, yes, okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Because I'm getting a note from, from Dr. Hudson. Okay. Um, if I have to, I'll switch, I'll switch to my phone. But um, wh where I was going with this is that a lot of these decisions are not necessarily patient um, or doctor based, they are insurance based. Mm. The insurance will say, look, you know, we're not going to cover this type of test. Or sometimes the laboratory will say, well, we don't participate with Medicaid. So if the patient wants the test, they're going to have to pay for it out of pocket. Now, you and I both know a genetic test can easily run about $2,000. That's more than, you know, that's rent and food and clothes and just gas and, you know, everything you need for, for one or two months, depending on your situation. So it really, it really becomes, it really becomes very difficult. Sometimes I have to ask, I have to kind of see if there's maybe another test that they could have that's maybe a little bit more reasonable, mm -hmm. um, you know, instead of the test that I do want, or sometimes we just kind of have to say, look, you know, is there, anybody who would help you pay for this is there it, it 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 becomes really really difficult so you know the access the access is 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 always is always an issue now sometimes we do try to talk people into maybe doing something on a research basis and as i'm sure you can imagine we're going to get into why in certain communities that it becomes an issue that is not something that they want to do for a lot of the reasons that we're going to get into, into, into this, in this lecture. I don't want to, I don't want to jump ahead of the conversation, but that, that is something that, you know, we try to do, we try to, we try to do that. And sometimes, you know, if you can try to get into, if we can try to um, work with some clinics, some clinics are federally funded clinics and they have grants. And sometimes, depending on the type of clinic that you're in, you might be able to get some of these tests paid for by the clinic. So sometimes we have to work around things that way. Mm -hmm. So sort of, I guess, since we've started back in the day, we'll, we'll, we'll linger in the past a little bit longer before we come to the present day. But I wanted to get into kind of how... <clears throat> Um, the medical and scientific community has exploited um, our bodies as their sort of research material um, to create the racist dogmas under which we live around our biological differences based on race, how that's contributed to every facet of our society and the very real like personal prejudices and biases that doctors now have about <laughs> Black people and, and, and how that contributes to how the treatment we do or don't, don't receive. So I thought maybe John, if you could speak to that. Well, it's a, it's a really uh, convoluted and complicated tale of uh, how race is constructed, essentially beginning with physicians actually um, developing the idea of race and racial groups. So this took, took place in Europe in the 1700s. There's some earlier examples from a man named Bernier, who was a French uh, scholar in the 1600s, who actually comes up with the idea of, of uh, uh, the term race and he applies it in a continental way, which is what we're most familiar with, Europeans, Africans, Asians, etc. But it really comes down to uh, uh, Carlos Linnaeus, who is the Swedish physician who uh, developed the taxonomic classification system that we use today to classify all living things. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, a German physician who um, coined the term Caucasian. And um, the um, uh, really prolific scholar, uh, uh, Georges Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, who wrote a 46 volume study of natural history that was just immensely re well received in his day. These three gentlemen, amongst others, uh, came up with the theory of race as we know it today, the idea of 
dividing human populations into racial groups. And they did that based on the Bible. So we have been, we've been given the, the, the idea that modern science uh, developed as a way of uh, creating or promoting secularism and actually demystifying uh, society and nature and disenchanting society. Um, and, and the idea is that this was a movement away from Christianity and away from religion to pure science. It's very falsely presented that way because the scholars who actually developed early science were Christians and they did so using the Bible as their frame of reference. And they were not about trying to disprove Christian theology. In fact, much of their science was geared towards trying to show from a scientific perspective, the validity of their faith. And so what they did was they took the story of Adam and Eve. Now, let's keep in mind, first of all, that this, the Genesis in the Old Testament, uh, there's a story of a great flood and all human beings are wiped out except for the family of Noah. So from that point on, all human beings are traced to Noah and his three sons. And they are basically identified ethnically or eth ethnographically as Europeans, Asian, African, um, uh, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. But all human beings originated, according to the story, from Adam and Eve. So what Blumenbach and De Buffon and, um, and Linnaeus came up with, amongst others, was the fact that all human beings came from Adam and Eve. And as the world was reconfigured by their Christian God and leaving only Noah's family, once that family moved around the world, um, they basically degenerated from the original stock into the other populations that were, according to Blumenbach, Linnaeus, et cetera, non-Caucasian. So their idea of the origins of the, uh, their, their construction, their framework for the origins of race and racial groups was that Adam and Eve were white people and that all other groups, non-whites, are degenerates from that original white stock due to the degradation from the environments in which they, they had to live. So Europe was posited as this uh, paradise in a sense in terms of human development and uh, the home for the superior people on the planet because with the creation of race, there's immediately a hierarchy that's established with Europeans at the top. So these physicians developed this idea that um, is the exact opposite of the modern uh, theory of out of Africa, which posits that human beings originated on the African continent and migrated subsequently around the world. So this is, this is where they start. This is the starting place. So if, if, if African people essentially are degenerate from that construct and that conception, that's part of the justification used to enslave. African people, and not just enslave them, um, you know, put them in a, a situation of chattel bondage, but to make it permanent and hereditary, lifetime and hereditary bondage. And that's predicated on the notion that uh, African people are uh, a subspecies or subhuman, but um, uh, essentially inferior to European white populations. So that becomes a justification. So then um, there's no, uh, there's pushback, of course. Some, some scholars obviously uh, go in different directions, but that becomes a pre prevailing myth. Um, and it, it underscores the invention of whiteness, uh, this okay. is sort of invention of blackness. So uh, these European physicians come, come up with this construct, but it's US physicians who actually have much more, uh, opportunity to advance that theory because of enslavement, because they're, they're, Europe does not have that many enslaved Africans in the population, but in many places in Virginia colony, for example, Africans comprise as many as half of the people within a particular uh, uh, county in certain regions of, of the, what was then the colony of Virginia, there may have been the predominant population as occurred in the Carolinas as well. So it wasn't like there, were, um, there weren't people to, to examine and observe, et cetera, et cetera, in large numbers. Well, 
despite the fact that there's, there's a sort of claim that Africans are subhuman or separate species, that doesn't prevent uh, Europeans from having sex with African women and men. <laughs> of course not. Having children with African men and men. <laughs> uh, uh, and using them to, to, to study and learn human anatomy and learn about human physiology. Right. And but like, but Jen, as our resident geneticist, I mean, <laughs> there is no difference. Like the diff there are genetic differences are not based, are not the basis of race, correct? Like, let's just clear the air on that. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's, a, there's actually more genetic heterogeneity within the races than between the races. And I think that that's, you know, what, what we really have to remember. And I think if we're gonna bring the conversation a little bit more current, um, you know, and then I'll let, Doc, I'll let John get back to what he's saying. It has really changed my job because, you know, as I'm sure most people know, as a genetic counselor, you know, I have to take a family history and I have to ask, okay, where are your ancestors from? Because of course, some genetic traits are seen with a higher frequency in some populations than in others. But I have to tell you, my job is changing because of how society is changing. I have literally counseled people who are Asian Indian and married to a man of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. You know, I have counseled people from who have just literally come in and said, my mom is this, my dad is this. And it has really started to get to the point where we have just started offering what we call pan-ethnic carrier screening. It is just literally a large panel that covers, usually they cover around a hundred diseases because at this point it's just, it's getting harder to kind of say who's what and how yeah. do you classify people. Yeah. And I think and people, people are always kind of conflated over right. time. Right. That our genetic differences clearly because of like our ancestry are equivalent to this made up construct of race, you know, and how and those differences. Right. And it's very interesting because you will talk to patients, or not even patients, just even friends. I just remember friends from college who would not say, you know, I'm black or I'm white. They insisted on saying I'm biracial. Mm. You know, they they refused to be categorized. And I and and you know, it became an issue because they they actually had to add a category to the census for you know bi and multiracial people because that's one of the fastest growing demographics in this country, actually. So it really the lines are becoming very blurred. Unfortunately, that construct perpetuates racism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every every yeah. human being is a, a practically identical in terms of our genetic makeup. We're 99.5% identical. There's that 0.5% variation that occurs, and it doesn't occur in groups. It, incur it occurs on the individual level, which is, as you pointed out, Jennifer, um, uh, you may have more diversity in group or what you identify as your group and have, have more commonality with someone you identify as another group. In other words, a person in Ghana could be more gen genetically uh, related to a person in Sweden than to his own next door neighbor, or more genetically uh, you know, identical in that sense. Uh, John, you were mentioning earlier how the phys physiology of you know, white folk and black folk are often the same um, and that sort of is based on what, what you and Jen were just talking about. You know, when they present themselves to a physician, there's very little variation between what's happening inside of their bodies biologically, um, yet outcomes are completely disparate between those, those groups. So this, this has worked um, to our disadvantage, despite the fact that we're identical. Uh, it works to our disadvantage. So let's talk about how uh, we become the subject of experimentation and why. Yes. So essentially... Hey. <laughs> Come on, John. Okay, so <laughs> essentially what begins to happen in medicine <laughs> is that in the 1500s, uh, anatomy emerges as a, a real force in medical education. Now keep in mind, this is a very difficult thing to, to do and teach and learn because of the church's restrictions about 
performing autopsies or doing anatomical research on cadavers. This is taboo in society. Generally, this is limited to just people who have been executed, you know, who have committed a crime. How so crazy is that? That because of the this convoluted sense of religion and everything, that they, <laughs> it's more taboo to experiment on cadavers than living people. Absolutely. There are laws in this That's country crazy. In, the, in the 1700s about, you know, grave robbing was a crime. And the reason why people were robbing graves is because you can't teach medicine without teaching anatomy. They realized uh, early on that this notion of simply looking at a person and having some sense of, you know, could, you know internal uh, anatomy uh, was completely inefficient and was, in fact, there were so many misunderstandings. They relied for centuries on Galen, a Greek uh, anatomist who was confused about so many things about the body. And it wasn't until Vesalius actually corrected that in the 1500s that they began to recognize we have to get away from this old uh, Greek classical medicine because there's some serious problems there. And so this, uh, this desire uh, led people to take a lot of risk to get bodies to work on. Well, in, in, in the uh, American colonies, um, that's what uh, African-American bodies uh, served in medical schools. So the, the first, anatomical material. Yeah, and the first uh, uh, anatomy lab was set up at, U at the University of Pennsylvania, what is now the University of Pennsylvania Medical School by a man named William Shippen. He was educated in, in, in Scotland and it was a rage in Europe at that point to, to, to teach anatomy uh, and do dissections to, for that purpose. And so he, he brought the first anatomy lab to the US and okay, where do you get the cadavers from, right? So medical school students in the North are out digging up people's departed, dearly departed from graveyards, graveyards until state governments began to pass laws that permitted them to take executed convicts' bodies to the anatomy labs, right? How many executed convicts are there, though, compared to how many <laughs> medical students there are? Et cetera, et cetera. So you have to have a steady supply. So that's where poor Irish people, indigent people, Native Americans, and free and enslaved Africans come in. So the so basis of medical education is anatomy. And this is what distinguished physicians as scientists. This gave people cachet in the medical field. Keep in mind, during this time, anybody could claim to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And there were all kinds of healers. There were spiritualists. There were uh, herbalists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What distinguished the physicians from those lay people and those pretenders and posers was the scalpel and the knowledge they acquired by cutting into bodies and learning human systems. So what's crazy uh, though is that if 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 this is becoming um, you know a deeper exploration in the field and you require bodies and the only way to get bodies is to have convicts and then to have those convicts die, you, you're seeing a system that you can for easily convenient. Read yeah. with human beings who you don't value. Oh yes. Like and then there's you know, like you were saying with the prestige that comes with it, that's how we got the monstrous father of modern gynecology, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, well, and just going back to what we were the subject we were talking about, I mean, there were people who were, you know, robbing graves, but remember they were robbing got to when they were robbing slave graveyards. And, you know, that was because, again, you know, why did it matter, you know, if you were taking black bodies? Because we were, I'm sorry, something in my face. Because, you know, we were supposedly subhuman. We were not as intelligent as white people. And all we were there to do was, was work. And, you know, what difference did it make? What difference did it make if they dug up our bodies and used our bodies for experimentation? And actually, you know, I was reading, because um, I was trying to do a little bit of research, um, you know, before I got into this call, but I was reading that, you know, it was actually very commonplace, especially in Alabama and South Carolina, as you mentioned earlier, John, in South Carolina, there were more Africans than, than white people. I think it was two, two thirds of the population 
Well, they were breeding us as well. So. Well, they were breeding us as well. Agreed. But, <laughs> but, but the point is, you know, yeah. our bodies were, you know, just like I was saying, you need cadavers to do to do anatomy. So you know, black people. But it's not just cadavers. Like with the with the with the father oh, of course. Of biology, of course. those were, those of were course. live women, right? Well, we were oh. we were we were an easy source. Yep. An easy, reliable, and available source okay. to experiment on. And the most important thing to remember is that we you didn't have to give us consent because we were property, right? right? That's the biggest thing you have to remember in terms of this conversation is that to Mary and Sims and other physicians, the thought was, okay, but the slave master gave me permission oh, yeah. to do this. Oh, trust me, trust okay. me, they didn't need permission. You know what I'm saying? Like even today, they don't feel that they need permission to take our lives. They don't. Come on. No, clear. but in the case of Sims, he actually leased five of the women that he experimented on. So he rented them from their from their owners. But let, let's be clear also about grave robbing. So in many cases, when we're talking about the cadavers of enslaved people, they never saw a graveyard. They were never mm -hmm. buried. They were enslaved from the womb. And then they, when they died, they went to the dissection room. They didn't yeah. have the benefit of an afterlife. He said from the womb to the, you know what? I pray, I honestly pray that our ancestors, that the, whatever plane their souls are on are so far flung from the plane that their tormentors are on. I swear, just for my own sake. You know what I'm saying? That's just crazy. So let to think let about. me also be clear when there's a lack of cadavers, uh, and this was this was true in many instances at, at at big colleges where you know like University of Pennsylvania, et cetera. What what was discovered and inadvertently someone knocked over on, on the on the dock in care of South Carolina, North Carolina. Somebody knocked over a a, a, a keg, and the contents were uh, a cadaver, an African uh, body, uh, pickled or preserved in some fashion. And these, these big barrels were being shipped north. So bodies were being packed and shipped all over the place. And let me be clear, medical schools advertised that they had a ready access, not only of dead specimens, but living specimens. Mm. So to go back with what, to what Jen said, there's, there's really, there's, there's not much of a leap between um, operating on a cadaver to learn how to do something to operating on an enslaved person who has no ability to, cons to give consent or whose master may have sold them for that, you know, just to get the money. And in fact, these same hospitals uh, and clinics uh, that, that advertised that they had a ready supply, they also often advertised that they would take sick Negroes and that they would uh, purchase sick Negroes. And their, their purpose was either to experiment on them or to, in their minds, heal them and resell them. So there, there are countless <laughs> advertisements in newspapers all over the South for that. Uh, there's one famous Dr. Stillman in Charlotte who is a dermatologist. And in his ad, he wants, you if they've got kidney disease, heart disease, lung ailments, you name it, bring them to me. This guy is not trained in any of those uh, specialties. Yet his, his business was about taking sick Negroes, as they termed them, and healing them and putting them out on, our, on the auction block. And you were saying that like, um, in terms of, I mean, obviously the whole basis of, of modern medicine is, is, is predicated on this type of research and having access to um, specimens. And that also, you know, we started to see with the development of all of these research techniques and, and, and such, um, you said like an extension in the life expectancy of, of white people, um, but not with us. And I guess I, guess I also wanna kind of touch on, you know, like, Henrietta Lacks, for example, and like all of 
all of the ways that we have contributed to medicine and to, and to medical research, but we don't benefit from the knowledge that's been gained in that field, right? So let's, let's talk about Henrietta Lacks in the context of Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. Yeah. These are the three, okay. women, three, three, of, three of the 11 women that J. Marion Sims operated on to perfect his, his surgical repair of vesicle, vaginal, and rectal vaginal fistula. So Deidre Cooper Owens, uh, a really brilliant historian, uh, uses the term medical superbodies and applies that term to African women and Irish women. And the term medical supervisors goes to the fact that uh, they are believed to have, you know, they're impervious to pain. They can deliver a baby and go right back to work. They can wean their child in a matter of a few weeks or a month and go back to work. You know, they, they, they are, and in fact, when we think about the- Which is so crazy because it's like, that's not because of our innate abilities. We had no choice. We don't have any choice. <laughs> but, but think about it in this term, too. There are no gender differences in how enslavers treated African women as workers. Yeah. African women were yeah. put in the field and were just like men. They had babies, which made them valuable, but they were expected to deliver that baby and go right back to work, right? So these are medical superbodies. Henrietta Lacks was a medical super, super body in another century, a century later, but in, in a different cap capacity, but the same thing. But, but look at Anarka, Betsy, and um, Lucy. So these were three of the 11 women that, that Sims worked on, right? He did 30 surgeries on Anarka with no, with no anesthesia. But, but let, me, let me also be clear. Vesicle vaginal uh, fistulas and rectal vaginal fistulas those women would have walked through hell to get those things repaired, and they did. So even though, you know, Sims has a terrible reputation, and what he did to the women is nothing compared to what he did to Black infants. So uh, I'll go on back to the women, though. <laughs> the, yeah. the fact remains that without them, he never would have succeeded. And he makes that clear, that it was their willpower, their determination, Think about this now. These women were experiencing the leakage of feces and urine, in some cases both, in some cases one or the other, into their vagina every day. They were completely uh, unable to stop that. They had no control over it because this is a, is a rupture that causes the seepage to occur. This happens uh, as a result of prolonged labor. If you're malnourished, your labor is going to last much longer. Injuries that occur with the use of forceps to extract, that, that those tears could occur that way. So these are, these are debilitating conditions that still exist in the world today. And in Africa, whenever a, a physician shows up in remo remote and rural areas that can deal with that problem, women come from hundreds and hundreds of miles to get it treated because you're completely ostracized from your family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that Sims was able to protect that surgery on those women he had a little little office on a little dumpy street in Montgomery, Alabama, which was a backwater town. He had 11 bed hospital where he only worked on his slave women in his backyard. Two years after he published that, he, he opened the first women's hospital in the United States in New York yeah. City. He yeah. became the second wealthiest doctor in, in, in the country, according to his own uh, you know, statement, his own bi uh, biography, autobiography and became the head of the American Medical Association and the American Gynecological Association. So yeah, today, the Black mothers are still and, and I just, dying. I just, want to add, I just want to add that if you read about Marion Sims, he was described as a lackluster student by his medical school. <laughs> and he was quoted as saying that he really only saw medicine initially as just a way to earn a living. Not only that, he stated very clearly he did not like treating women. Yes. He, he did I, not want to have anything to do with treating women. He made very disparaging remarks about that. <laughs> and this is how he made his career. I know that makes any sense. Jen. <laughs> but he's not the only one when it comes to <laughs> experimenting. So modern gynecology is built on the backs of African-American women. 
the first. And yet uh, we don't benefit from it at all. Sorry, the I just had to put that surgery on ovaries, <laughs> the, the, the perfecting of the cesarean section, which was done in 1820, 1825 in New Orleans, and, and countless others that we don't know about. Uh, but, you know, if we take uh, Sims's career and really put it in context, he was looking at one point to figure out how to cure lockjaw. And his method for doing it was to take a shoemaker's awl, it's a little curved tool. It's, it's like elongated, like a, a ice pig, but it has a little scoop on the end of it. And he took that and he used that to pry apart the sutures of black infant's skulls. He killed every one of them. But his idea was maybe this will somehow relieve the pressure and would, would stop the lockjaw from occurring. And he talked about how grateful uh, the enslaved parents were that he was even going to try to help their particular child. Every child he experimented on died, as you might imagine, but that was just torture. There's no, there's no, there's no science to that. That was, but it was, it was based, it was partly based upon these thought processes, processes that were prevalent at the time that black people didn't feel pain the way white people felt pain. So, you know, it was okay to do these things and the black infant skulls, you know, developed differently than white infant skulls. So, so can I stop, can I stop you right there? Yeah. Uh, so and I think John reason, also had a question. For yeah, me. No, go ahead, go ahead, John. No, the reason why I want to stop you there is because you, you, you made it a historical kind of thing that black mm -hmm. people, that, that physicians or people felt black people were impervious to pain. That is part of medical folklore today. Correct. They still Absolutely. believe it. Lena Williams. They still believe it. And look, there's a study. Dr. Nancy Hudson. Yeah, sure. Well, there was That's a study done about three or four years ago that showed that because physicians system and, and, and Jennifer, you know this better than all of us in terms of dealing with sickle cell. Physicians undertreat uh, the pain of black folk. They underprescribe uh, analgesic medications mm -hmm. to the point that one study showed that during the opioid, which is still going on, the opioid epidemic, the white physicians refusing to prescribe pain medication for African Americans saved 30 to 40,000 black lives. 30 to 40,000 black people would have died over the last five years had they received the same medication prescriptions as their white counterparts. So no, black people's pain is not identified, recognized as the same as everyone else's to this no. day. No. Jen, so we, we've kind of touched on some of the experimentation done on black women historically, some that have experimented on uh, black infants. Let's fast forward a little bit to okay. 1932 and talk about yes. the uh, US <laughs> Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee or the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in a Negro male. Yes. Um, and it still revolves around people needing some significant medical treatment and being taken advantage of mm -hmm. while they're suffering. Right, so the Tuskegee experiment um, started in 1932. And a lot of people don't know this, but it was actually trying to mirror a similar study that was being done in, in Scandinavia. Um, and what happened was that um, in terms of how the study was conducted, it was about 400 um, black men um, in, in, in Tuskegee, Alabama, who were identified as being positive for syphilis. And initially, when this study started, um, there wasn't necessarily treatment for syphilis because we didn't know the role that penicillin had played initially in 1932. But once penicillin became kind of a common medication for many infections, not just syphilis, but for many infections, you know, after World War II, the issue became that they, it, you know, these doctors performing this, this study knew that penicillin was an efficient treatment for syphilis, but withheld treatment. But before we get into the penicillin, I want to kind of just go back into kind of the therapy, I guess, but difficult parts of, or, or, or parts of the study that were not done correctly before we got to the treatment. So these men were never really told, I think, 
correctly what their diagnosis was. So they were never really told the word syphilis. They were just told you have bad blood. And a lot of the counseling and education was also lacking. They were not told this is a sexually transmitted disease. You can now give this to your wives. A lot of people don't know this, but a child can be born with congenital syphilis, and it does it does have an effect on um, the nervous system. It can affect vision and hearing to a child that has con- a baby that has congenital syphilis. So not only were these men not really told their diagnosis, but they weren't really given, I guess, a lot of the counseling and and prevent and measures of prevention that I think should go into any type of discussion about a sexually transmitted disease. So so Jen, then, so these men were also were unwittingly potentially giving this to their spouses, girlfriends, lovers. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And then once penicillin became a cure, we knew that it was a cure, they were not given penicillin. And um, the kind of part of what makes it really bad is that their name was on a list. And this list was distributed to hospitals in the area. So if those men went to the hospital to seek care, they were pretty much told, well, your name's on the list. So, you know, we can't, we can't treat you. And this story broke um, in 1972. Um, and um, it was, I believe it was a New York Times reporter who, who was the whistleblower. But as you can imagine, you know, because of how syphilis is transmitted, because it's an STD, it wasn't just 400 people anymore who, was affect, who were affected. It was you know, the mag- magnitude, almost generations, really, um, who, are, who, are, who are affected by this. And I think that, you know, again, I don't want to go too far ahead of the conversation, but this study, this ex- experiment, let's just call it what it is, it has continued to be told, you know, really throughout, throughout generations. And I know when I first you know, got to the New York City area while I was working, before I got to my genetic degree, I was working simultaneously on my health advocacy degree. And um, this was in New York City around 2000. So this was when HIV advocacy was at its peak. And it really affected, you know, my ability to be able to advocate um, and teach people about HIV because anytime you try to talk to the black community about this is, you know, an STD, these are things you need to do, safe sex condoms, it kind of became, well, you know, but this is just like, this is just like Tuskegee, you know, you're from the government and you're telling me things that aren't true and you're actually, you know, how, how do I know that this isn't the government giving me HIV or telling me something wrong because they let me people die in Alabama and they didn't treat them. So, and it's also directly affecting what's going on now with the COVID vaccine. You know, you mm-hmm. have black people who will not take the COVID vaccine because they're still thinking about Tuskegee. So, and I don't want to jump too far into the conversation because we're going to be just talking about No, I mean, the thing is, it's all interconnected. This is like, this is like a, a time machine, right? We have to keep jumping in and going back and it, forth. It is, it is all interconnected and um, I wanted to kind of continue, you know, because Jonathan now got me on, because he now he got me on a tangent, or did he do the wrong thing because he got me talking? But I also <laughs> but I also wanted to just add, you know, we also need to remember um, you know what goes on in the Latinx community communities. And we also need to remember maybe they didn't have the Tuskegee experiment, but they did have forced sterilization, which We're happened sterile. to which happened to, you know, the women on the island of Puerto Rico from nineteen thirty to nineteen seventy. And last year with and last, <laughs> you know, in the last force and, and and there were a lot of forced sterilizations in this country that a lot of people don't know about. I think this was happening up until the nineteen seventies, really, um, in the in the Carolinas. If you were, you know, really the biggest thing was if you were poor, you were deemed unfit, or you were deemed feeble-minded, which can mean a lot of things, you know. 
there was the, or, 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 you, or you were simply the victim of what Fannie Lou Hamer called a Mississippi appendectomy. Yes. So when you went to the hospital for any type of surgical procedure, they sterilized black women without yeah. their knowledge and consent, as they did to Fannie Lou Hamer. Yeah. It called it a she, she called it a Mississippi appendectomy. Yes. So, but if, if I can for a second, I want to go back to Tuskegee and and, and in reference to the COVID vaccine, I'm, I'm writing about this right now. So. The problem with Tuskegee is the media has glommed on it as a sort of the way of explaining what they call vaccine hesitancy in African American community. So, in fact, Tuskegee has been has become sort of a lodestone for any uh, media explanation for African Americans' issues around, you know, medical care, experimentation. In fact, maybe in that forty-year period, you know, about a hundred African American men may have died during that, that period. But we have to keep in mind, we lose anywhere from 60 to 75,000 people every single year from excess deaths and premature deaths in our community. And so, you know, we, we have to be careful about things like Tuskegee because they can distract us and away from the, the real uh, uh, profound problem we have with death and dying in this society, with being killed in this society. Uh, through medical neglect, uh, health care disparities, and health disparities in our country. And also, just one final point, when it comes to Latinos, the U.S. Public Health Service went straight to Guatemala mm -hmm. with that study and did the yeah. same thing in Guatemala. So, yeah, wherever they can find a, 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 an innocent population or a, a population that could be exploited, apparently, you know, that would be the intent. Um, you know, and going offshore, particularly in the 70s, after we get uh, informed consent, you know, we get IRB comes into play after Tuskegee. So you have to have institutional review board look over any human subject experimentation. Well, you know, organizations, uh, corporations, etc., go to Africa, they go to Europe, they go to Central yeah. Europe, and they do the studies without uh, supervision from the U.S. government. So. Yeah. Two quick quick things. Um, one on Tuskegee. I think one of the reasons why Tuskegee is so prevalent in discussions about COVID and, and other uh, you know um, issues is because most people just don't really understand what Tuskegee was. You know, I think a lot of people who watch this video, Jen, will learn something new by what you described. Most people think Tuskegee was, you know, the government giving something to black people and letting them die. Yeah. And that's just not true at all. And when you understand what Tuskegee was, you understand that, you know, this COVID pandemic and the vaccine vaccine vaccination process mm -hmm. is completely unrelated to what we what we dealt with with uh, with Tuskegee. Um, and it also does not have to do with Tuskegee Airmen, because I've had to have that conversation too. Yeah, and then uh, you know, to your point, uh, Dr. Chenault, um, you know, it's interesting when we get into the Latinx discussion because, you know, one of the conversations a lot of people don't like to have is that, you know, people who are Latino are, a lot of them are actually Black, right? There are, you know, a huge population of Black Latinos across the world. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to talk about that because some Latinos you know, identify themselves, uh, you know, politically and, um, you know, economically with with white folks, and that's advantageous for them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when, the, when you talk about these people going to Guatemala and some of these other areas to experiment on Latin people, they're still experimenting on, on people who came from Africa. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. that's true. It's, it's definitely true. So you touched on, oh, sorry, go ahead. Were you, were you gonna? Well, I was, I just wanted to kind of just kind of just pull in, um, you know, another kind of example of, you know, how Tuskegee to, back to Dr. Small's point, can kind of distract us from large issues because what happened was, um, and this is kind of what, this is where my thesis pulls in, but, um, I did my thesis on sickle cell disease 
um, Buffalo advocacy and the National Center for Social Disease Act in 1972. And what a lot of people don't know is that there was an act that was signed by Congress in 1972 that was supposed to give money towards social cell advocacy and funding for education, including genetic counseling, right? Which, you know, and I just want to say, you know, genetic counseling, only about one to two percent of genetic counselors are, are Black. You know, so I'm in a very, you know, particular role here that I do take pride in. But anyway, the point is that, you know, this act, they were working on it, there was some pushback from the community because, again, a lot of people didn't know what genetic counseling was. But there are still people, even today, who think genetic counselors, we go around telling people you can't have babies. You know, that's not what we do. They said it was a thought process of, you know, you're telling people we're supposed to say you can't have babies. That's not what we were doing. And the point is, we were trying to get the momentum going to, you know, really kind of do something about advocacy for the disease. But then when the story dropped about Tuskegee later on that year, that was the end of that. And right. the sickle cell community still, in my opinion, does not have the funding or the advocacy or the genetic counseling you know, that is needed. So this one experiment has had long-term ramifications in terms of how we treat the disease. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring to bring that full circle because Dr. Shalot made a very good point. This one study is affecting really management, like how we manage our care as black people and what are and people of color and, and other issues that we probably should be addressing that we can't because we always have to backtrack and deal with people's thoughts about Tuskegee. Yeah. I want to pivot a little bit to um, <clears throat> sort of looking at over that same timeline that we've been discussing what our access to healthcare has been. Obviously, throughout this whole time that we were enslaved, <clears throat> we were the anatomical material for medicine for them, for their healthcare. But um, with, you know, the end of slavery, if it ended, indeed, I don't, it doesn't seem like it did, but <clears throat> with the law ending It's a different slavery era, now. Yeah. Um, and then into, like you said, the Jim Crow era, that whole time, we also didn't have access to medical care. We, you know, there were Black doctors, you know, over time that became trained. There were some white doctors that would see us for certain things, of course, in segregated, you know, um, settings. And a lot of times, especially where we're talking about like emergency care or something, surgery, stuff like that, of course we weren't, there were some hospitals we weren't even allowed to step foot in, you know what I'm saying? Like our ICU, you couldn't be seen in the ICU even. So like looking at that, like, I guess let's start there, but I would hope, I hope to get to the points where we're talking, we start talking about how we need to look at contemporary um, training for medical professionals um, in, the, in that context. But I guess, can you take us a little bit through what access to medical care has looked like for Black people over, over our So let's go, let's go back to the enslavement period. And the fact is that Africans preferred their own healers and they certainly had medical knowledge and they came here with medical knowledge to the point mm -hmm. that uh, for sure. example, there was knowledge of uh, smallpox inoculations in, in Black communities, and they introduced that information in Boston, even though some people looked askance at it because it came from an African source. Nevertheless, uh, it, it was utilized. So Africans had their own healers and preferred their own healers, and some of their healers became so renowned, they got their freedom because they treated white uh, people successfully and as a result many of them were able to either buy their freedom or they were granted their freedom on plantations generally the enslaver did the medical work if if the unfortunate african enslaved person came under their radar they would prefer to go to their own uh cure cure uh curandero or whatever that person may have been called and um uh but the 
every plantation and mostly every household had a big giant book of medical remedies, usually a, an herbal pharmacopoeia and that kind of thing. Uh, but doctors were also very much on hire for plantation uh, service. Some of them did it on a per fee basis. Some of them did it on a contractual basis. Many of them bought their own plantations and bought their own uh, enslaved people as well. So after enslavement, um, uh, that just completely ends. So during the Jim Crow period uh, and well into the early 1900s, they're, they're, until the advent of, of black physicians and nurses, uh, healthcare is, is very rare or very limited because there are not many white physicians who are attending to, to black patients, for example, and there are no hospitals for the most part. Some of them had Negro sections where, where that would happen, but you might know the famous story of Bessie Smith after an automobile yeah. accident being driven around yeah. and not getting admitted. That's a common occurrence, right? So let's keep this in mind. This is not just a problem for African-Americans. It's a problem across the country because Look, Medicare and Medicaid don't come into being until 1960. So most people, unless they have resources, don't have health insurance, they don't have access to regular care. So that's a problem in general. But it's compounded for African-Americans for a couple of reasons. AMA is founded in, I believe, 1843, in the height of antebellum uh, slavery era, right? They are not admitting African-American physicians. They're not, uh, even in the early uh, even to the 1960s civil rights era, they did not stand up for desegregation. They did not advocate desegregating hospitals, desegregating medical schools. They, they have never been in, in, in the forefront of trying to, to, to make uh, health care equitable in this society. They're still leading from behind. So uh, not only have they been uh, behind the effort, uh, far behind providing the services that this country needs, in the early 1900s, they hired Abraham Plexner, who wrote a report. He went around and looked at every medical school in the country, including all the black medical schools and the women's medical schools. And he wrote a report that basically shut down all but two African-American medical schools, Howard University mm -hmm. and Harry. And a new study has recently come out, which estimates that as many as 30,000 doctors would have been produced by those schools that, that were shut down. Now, the basis for their closure was they had inadequate resources, facility, training, instructors, et cetera, et cetera. Where were African-Americans supposed to get all that stuff? You know, African-Americans have been doing the best they could do uh, with the limited resources they had to bring health care to our community. The first African-American physician went to Scotland to get educated because they wouldn't let him in Columbia, even though he was brilliant. He was so brilliant when he came back in, in uh, James McCoon Smith, when he came back to the United States, he became the first black pharmacist and had a pharmacy in New York. He founded the uh, New York chapter of the American Statistical Association. He's the first African-American we know of to use statistics to refute scientific racism. So, you know, African-Americans, when they got into a position, uh, they used their abilities as best they could to reach as many people as they could and to affect as much change, but they found themselves out of profession, they could not join professional associations. They could not, you know, practice medicine in the same way as their as their white counterparts. So, they did heroic jobs, particularly in the segregated South. Medical professionals were the heroes in the segregated South. African American medical professionals, men and women, uh, going into rural areas to treat uh, people and bring medical care where it was simply not available. So keep in mind, up until 1960, no Medicare, no Medicaid. The majority of African Americans have always lived in the South. Certainly there was a mass migration, but still the majority have always been in the South. And so you can imagine what was available to those communities in terms of health care, you know, and the struggles to get health care. And the idea of prevention of disease was completely non-existent or health education, that kind of thing, preventative medicine, it wasn't happening. So um, we're dealing with the, um, the legacy of that because we're now seeing, in, uh, and maybe Jen can talk about, uh, the issue of epigenetics is now emerging, this, the mm -hmm. science of epigenetics. And we're saying this can be trauma that's transferred multi-generationally. 
so that you know what's happened to African Americans in the in the 1800s and 1900s just simply didn't disappear because of the passage of time. It can be genetically <laughs> yeah. a, a factor in in generations that have come since then. We were just talking about that the other day, actually, yeah. with our genetic yeah. intern because. Um, she she found all this research for us, you know, about about um, physiological changes that happen, all this stuff. It's demonstrable, right? Yeah. And it was just so funny to to us because we were just like, that's that's the angle that we're going to approach it with because it's like the gaslighting that we always get, you know, from white people is that you know there's always there's always a better explanation than racism right. for what they do, right? Always, we she just must have misinter uh, misinterpreted it. But what we're seeing from the data that we should care about, you know, if, you know, that's the thing is like getting scientists and doctors over their biases. They should care about the data and the epigenetic changes that they're seeing in our communities. But, and so I just hope it's the kind of thing that we can use to finally be like, look, here you go. Like you might not have thought it was racism, you might have thought it was microaggression. You may have thought he should have got shot because he was resisting. But we can't make up fear. We can't make up right. the fear response. We can't make up all of that. We're not. We're not like subconsciously, like artificially directing ourselves to have like a fight or flight response. You know that it is what it is, and you know the fact that we're still like kind of ignoring that just kind of belies the total lack of investment into research studies that um, would help us figure out what's wrong with us. Do you know what I mean? What what has all of these centuries of murder and torture and persecution wreaked havoc on our bodies? Nobody cares about those studies. Let's be clear. Well, um, I think, <laughs> sorry, I'm leaning back a little bit because I know that my mic is a little choppy, but um, I think one thing I took away from our intern research was that we, because of the amount of stress in our environment, we as Black people are always in a constant state of fight or flight. We never get to a calm baseline, right. for lack of a better phrase. And because of that, it, it has real effects on our health, on our health. It has real effects on you know, hypertension. It has real effects on how we're able to combat autoimmune disorders such as diabetes, it has real effects on mental illness because mental illness is a mixture of genetic predisposition as well as environmental triggers. And so, you know, as Black people, there are a lot of environmental triggers that we are subjected to. Um, but I did want to also bring up another issue in terms of access. Um, or in terms of access to health care. And I do want to bring up that I feel like in, in a practical manner, in terms of ability to access going to the doctor, I think that has improved for, for Black people. But you have Black people who still are scared to go because of what they've heard their ancestors have gone through or even their parents or grandparents um, and medical racism that they've endured. And so I think that there is a certain amount of advocacy that we can do in hood medicine to kind of encourage black people to say, you know, this is, this is what you need to do. You need to not be scared and we're gonna walk you through this. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting because I think, and I think Dr. Hudson would agree, we could spend three, four, five hours you know, talking about all these, you know, medical racism issues. Um, but one of the things that came up recently uh, that we want to get you guys um, insight on is the journey, the Journal of American Medicine and their recent podcasts where they decried that there's no racism in medicine. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Have you have you read? Wait, the it's it's actually JAMA. It's the Journal of the American Medical Association. Just in case there's another organization that doesn't want to be confused with these racist jerks. But yeah, it's JAMA. Have you guys you know read up on the issue and what were your thoughts 
uh, when you when you when you well, were yeah, for our listeners, you know, they had a podcast where I guess one of their one of the heads of their journal, the chief editor or whatever, he said, no physician is racist, so how can there be structural racism in healthcare? An explanation of the idea by doctors for doctors in this user-friendly podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, indicative of, uh, of the. Uh, of Why the, are we doing this? Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's indicative of the establishment, the medical establishment, leading from behind again. So, mm. just in November 2020, uh, AMA issued a policy statement saying medical schools should move away from teaching race based medicine. Race is a, a, a social construct and medical schools should be moving away from teaching it as a biological construct. Now, this is November 2020, 70 years ago. UNESCO, American Physiolo Physical Anthropo Anthropological Association, American Anthropological Association, and others came out and started that conversation after World War II. And uh, by the 90s had done something significant to move in that direction. So here we are in 2020 and the American Medical Associ Associ Association is just arriving at a, a policy point with still no guidelines, no directives, no whatsoever, nothing else whatsoever. So they're in denial. And let me say that uh, we, did, we really talked about, uh, you know, the anatomy aspect of, and all of that in terms of early uh, medical history. What we also have to point to, and I'll just say this very briefly, is that uh, U.S. doctors in the 1700s and moving forward spent a tremendous amount of energy uh, trying to define racial differences between blacks and whites on the basis of physiology, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, they, they come up with these and now they want to be like, shut up, it's not about race. Yeah, it's not about race, right? So they come up with this notion that 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 black uh, that black people's brains and the, the bile, the blood, all that is blackened in our body. We even have black sperm. There's there's a certain kind of lice that they said only uh, uh, was attracted only to black bodies. I mean, you know, the thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, Josiah Knott um, in the 1850s or 60s comes up with 126 uh, phys physical signs of, of, of black uh, degeneracy to the point where he believes blacks evolve separately uh, as a separate species altogether. So he's a polygeneticist in that sense. So, so they, they spent that, um, those centuries uh, defining uh, biological differences uh, on the basis of race. And so when you go into medical literature today, when you look at the journals and, and you go into the journal archives, if you look at even the things that are being published today, that's what you see. You see race-based medicine. You go to, to, to the National Library of Medicine database and do a search on diabetes. Even now, after all of what we're talking about, you're going to find articles that talk about African-American diabetes compared to Latino uh, in LA. Now, first of all, I mean, you know, I, I, I'll grant you the African-American definition. What is a Latino? How are you going to compare African-Americans to a Latino population? What is that? Even if we went, let's, let's be a little bit more granular. Let's compare African-Americans to Indonesians. Who in the world are we talking about? Or Filipinos? How, I mean, you know, even Indians in, East, in, in, in India. Mm -hmm. The diversity of these populations is off the chart. Right. Yet, if you go in the medical literature, it's taken for granted. And if you read the method section in those articles, there is not a single explanation of who they're talking about. They say, you know who we're talking about. We said Latinos. You know exactly what we mean. <laughs> no, we don't. You need to define the populations that you're referring to. Otherwise, what everything that comes from that, what does it mean? It has no validity. What, what could it possibly mean? Who are you comparing? You know, we, we, we don't have groups that you can define as Latinos. We don't even have groups that you can define as Black. There is no genetic uh, basis for any of those things. So we have to be very precise when we're talking about populations. We have to talk about genetic ancestry as well as how people self-identify, whether you self-identify as African-American, this, that, or the other. So the point is for them to be in denial 
at this stage in history. There's no system, systemic racism in medicine when the entire, the whole body of literature is, is imbued with racist uh, garbage, for lack of a better term, uh, terms that mean nothing. And so, you know, we're forced, and, and actually we have to really stop and think about the world that we're conditioned to, to, to live in. Yeah. We are forced to use terms that, and every day, and we accept these terms every day as if they have value and validity. It's like yeah. the, the, the common phrase, we watch the sunrise and the sunset. The sun doesn't do any such thing. The earth is rotating on its axis, right? And this is how we're dealing with- I don't with know, like, isn't it flat? If that's well, weird. Cause I mean, like, <laughs> they've been talking about how it might be- Flat, yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh, I just, I just froze, John. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. That's oh. what happens when you use scientific disinformation on a hood med check. <laughs> see, see, what, see what you did? You know, the, the interesting thing, what we hope uh, to get John back, is when these doctors in 2021 say that there's no racism in medicine, it's just yet another way to erase the humanity of black people because black people know and experience this thing every single day we don't even have to go that far back to you know right. showcase prominent black people like serena williams who experienced racism on the operating table you know mm -hmm. these things are happening every single day and when you come out in 2021 and say oh you know physicians aren't racist that's just I mean, that I belies their own, that belies their own delusion, yeah. though. I mean, they, honestly, I don't know what white people imagine racism is. I guess in their mind, maybe it's only, like, in those movies that they see, like, Selma. I don't know. It's well, all, like, it in their mind, they, it's, like, defined as this very specific period in history, and then it was over because Martin Luther King said we shall be friends. No, it was over when Barack Obama became president. Well, the, oh, the right. issue... The issue is yeah. that in their in their mind, they don't see that hard that hardcore racism like you're talking about in Selma. And as far as they're concerned, well, there's black medical students yep. in their class. And let me let me say something. They in in their mind, it's we let you go to medical school now. We let yeah. you become president now. No, so I don't even the think racism? they. I don't even think they think about it. I think in their minds, they. I mean, we're to the point where their rhetoric is is, is revolves around how we overhype everything as racism. Like we're foisting racism onto everything as if it doesn't well, belong to them. You inhabit it. And well, we're, we're, ju we're just telling you what we see. Well, no, and that's a problem for them. It's not, it's not that. We're proclaiming. Because when a white person brings up racism, they're liberal and they're trying to help and they're trying to change the world. But when we as black people bring up racism, oh but we're complaining. You're complaining. Yeah. You 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 went to MIT. You went to Sarah Lawrence. You have a nice job. Why are you complaining? Your basketball players make millions of dollars every single year. Why are you complaining? And don't forget Beyonce. Don't forget it's not, Beyonce. but it's not the complaint. I don't think they even register like in their mind, there is no nuance. There's none. Even though they've built our entire global cultural society, the entirety of civilization is built on racism, on white supremacy. But in their minds, it's a very binary, very narrow definition. So they don't see any of the nuance well, that, that we well, live the with. Other, the other issue I First thing I thought when I saw your, you know, the link was who was their sample? Who did they ask? That was the first thing that I didn't ask said. anybody. He was declaring it for everyone okay. that there's no racism. He was just declaring it. Well, that's, that's, that's my point. It's, it's yeah. I, you're cutting out a little bit. Is it, who was he talking to? Yeah. Oh, I think it was like a podcast. So he, so someone was like interviewing him and he was like, um, so he was just like, you know, 
he wants to move away from using the term racism. He says, what you're talking about isn't so much racism. It isn't their race. It isn't their color. It's all their socioeconomic status. That's, that's what they always try to push. And he says that we, you know, you know, that like, that we should move away from like saying the word racism and that we should take it out of the conversation and instead focus on the structural aspect of socioeconomics. But I don't know why they refuse to concede that the way they built the system is predicated on racial bias. It's not just about being but if they, they concede to that, that's admitting guilt. In their yeah. minds, they believe that racism is a, a verbal thing. Racism is saying, I hate, I, I really hate um, N words. the N word. <laughs> Yeah, no, racism I know. <laughs> is burning a cross, you know, on somebody's lawn. Racism yeah. is lynching somebody. So if they're not doing one of those three things or something in those three categories, then they're not being racist. But and they also want to reserve the right to plausible deniability. They want to always be able to say, that's probably not what she meant, though. And you, you know, know and that's mean? exactly what I was getting to, right? <laughs> the, the way they define, define, or the way they find an out from racism today is they will say, I don't know what was in his mind. Mm. You know, I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know what he was thinking when he said that. I don't. I can't say he was racist because I, I don't know what he was thinking. And that's, no one knows what anybody else was thinking. So that's <laughs> the, worst, the worst way of getting out of a, you know, or maybe the most brilliant way of getting out of calling a spade a spade is to say, well, I, I wasn't in his head when he said it. So I, how can I call him a racist? Right. I said people will say, I wasn't there. I'm yeah. just going off of what you're telling me. Yeah. Oh, all the time. They always want to and the thing is, is that, that that's always the challenge. I don't think they ever once taken what you actually say and how you felt about it, how it impacted you. It's never about that. It's always about defending the action of the person who said it and finding a reason for why. Well, there must have been a reason why, you know, unless it's the N-word and then it's like... And, and again, that is yet another method of taking our humanity away from us. And when people, when people argue about whether or not words can be violent, they don't understand that all of these circumstances are violence against Black people. Mm -hmm. These microaggressions, the yeah. denial of our lived experiences, those are acts of violence. When it comes to these, these situations and these ex experiences in the medical industry, when we're trying to get care for our health, you know, that's even more devastating to us because that's the only place we can go to find some solution to a medical issue we're having. Right, right. John! <laughs> Joe, glad to have you back. I don't know what happened. Welcome to the Zoom world. <laughs> no, that was wild. Uh, you froze, and then all of a sudden, I, I know connected, <laughs> and I couldn't get back in. And wow, I sent you an email saying Dr. Hudson's fault. The it's my internet fault. are allergic to her. I know. <laughs> I have a curse. I'm always passing it on to others. Like, <laughs> um. No, you were in the middle of responding to the to the JAMA declaration that there was no... Yeah, I, I was just ranting about the fact that uh, <laughs> if you look at the history of, uh, of uh, medical, uh, the medical establishment, in particular medical literature, it's replete with, uh, with anti-Blackness, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, pretty much uh, is everywhere in evidence. And um, when you go into the medical journal archives of any journal that's been around any time for any length of time, and particularly for those that are, you know, that, that date from the 1800s and the early 1900s, um, it's an excursion through hell because of the, 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 the very, the kind of uh, 
the meaning, the humanizing uh, treatment of African Americans in those articles as patients, the kinds of things they say about African Americans um, uh, that uh, are, are so uh, demeaning. And um, even the things they said publicly at conferences uh, in the 60s and 70s, as late as uh, those decades, uh, you had people in conferences disparaging African Americans uh, with impunity, essentially. When you, when I assume, when they looked out in the audience, they saw very few brown faces, so they felt free to say things like, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember this particular person's name, but in the '60s, the comment was made: um, uh, "We choose Negroes for our experiments because, like cats, nobody cares." This is the 1960s. I do know a Harvard uh, uh, physician stated like in early 70s that it was true that African-Americans were um, mentally immature and childlike in terms of our psychology and they had to be dealt with in that way. This mm -hmm. is the early, early 70s. So, you know, there's a medical folklore that persists. It's racist to the core. It's because the founders of these practices and disciplines and specialties in many instances were just uh, racist uh, to, to their hearts and, um, and they laid the foundation. So one of the things that we have to do in understanding this process today is to look at the history of, of clinical practices, to look at the history of specialties, to trace them to their origins so that we can understand the problems. I'll just give one very quick example. So the notion that African Americans are deficient in terms of our, our respiratory ability, our lung capacity, et cetera, dates back, yeah. to, dates back to Thomas Jefferson in, 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 the, in the 1700s, early 1800s, and is picked up in the 1850s again by a man named Samuel Cartwright. He agrees with Jefferson's perceptions and he recommends, uh, as Jefferson did, physical labor, put them out in the fields, it'll, it'll improve their lung capacity. This is at the same time in the 1850s when Cartwright is speaking, when the spirometer is invented. So the spirometer is a device you breathe into to, to measure that, you measure your lung efficiency and capacity. It's well, a lung function test. It's a lung function test. And so um, initially it's calibrated with the, with the white normal in, in index, and then uh, what are created are race corrections to adjust for the fact that not just uh, African Americans are considered uh, in, in, inefficient, all other groups. So there is a Mexican race correction, which they use for all Latinos, and there's an Asian one as well. This, this is being used today. So, you know, when we look at uh, certain types of tests and practices, et cetera, et cetera, we need to look at their history to see where, they, where, where they've come from, where they originated, it can be very, very, very revealing, like the spirometer. And there are many, many other examples of algorithms and other types of race corrections that are still in use today without any scientific basis whatsoever. So for AMA to make those kinds of statements or for JAMA editors to allow someone to publish that kind of stuff is absurd. Well, I, I'd like to piggyback on that with the short story as well. Um, and Dr. Hudson has already laughed. She's known me for years. She knows I don't have short stories. I was just about to say, what story <laughs> have you ever told? <laughs> that is brief. <laughs> but um, anyway, I was, so everybody knows I've already, you know, because I've always worked in the medical field, usually I've always, I've always been good about getting my charts and, you know, being able to follow up with my doctors and ask the right questions. And um, I was going through my chart. And for people who have never been to the OBGYN, you know, when you go, they ask you, you know, are you, are you married? Are you single? Like, what are your habits? What are your special habits? This and that. You ask men, all these different things they ask you, right? But the point is, I was going through my chart and I saw that I had been screened for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And I don't remember signing a consent form. And um, a, a doctor friend of mine, who I still, I still know, 
she said to me, you know, they, they profiled you. They profiled you. You're a black woman. Mm. They ran the test. Now, everyone knows I've, I, I had been married by this point, you know, like this, I, I'm not that type of, well, I don't want to say that, but I was about to say, because that sounds pretty supportive. But the point is I was in a stable relationship. I really just did not see the need to offer that test. I was never asked. And I think that that plays into the stereotype, the very old stereotype that Black people are hypersexual beings, yeah. right? Because this is why they justify raping Black female slaves. This is how they justify treating Black men the way that they did in terms of keeping them away from white women. Because as a race, we're over-sexualized. And my point, but where I'm going with this is, this is an example of how we're treated, right? This is an example of how we're treated in the medical environment. But because these thoughts that apparently don't exist, according to this man who ran this podcast, mm -hmm. it dictates how we're being treated. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that, that is, and, and my, I'm telling this story because if they'll do it to me, imagine what they'll do to someone who doesn't have background, doesn't have the knowledge, isn't checking their charts, doesn't know how to ask questions, doesn't have friends who are doctors. Remember, most of my friends are doctors or genetic counselors, so you can't exactly just tell me something and think, and think I'm not going to follow up on it. So I just want people to understand that if that's how they're treating me, then how do you think they're treating other people? Right. I wanted us to close with um, you. You want you don't want to close with my story? No, <laughs> no I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, no. I thought maybe we could um, close first of all and just like kind of have each of you tell us like first of all what you think about two things, both sides of the coin. Like what you think about what we can do to encourage more of us to pursue careers in STEM and medicine across the board um, and participate in research that benefits us. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, what can we do, like especially for your, for your research and what you, your current role, John, like what can we do to help better train, um, you know, our, I guess white and other like non-black doctors to start combating centuries of bias and, and propaganda and how like medical education on these histories and, and that context goes to that. So I guess um, maybe Jen, do you wanna start? Um, I am in the process now um, of actually starting to do some work with um, a, uh, NSGC um, and the team at Integrated Genetics um, and also the American Board of Genetic Counseling. Um, I am starting to do some work with those committees to really try to do more outreach um, in terms of just really making the field become more um, recognizable. Um, and I'm keeping this conversation kind of particular to genetic counseling, because I feel like a lot of people do not know what genetic counseling is, but I think there's a real need for it. Um, so I'm currently in the process of, you know, working on some outreach programs um, with integrated and just trying to do some diversity workshops and really get the awareness out there of what genetic counseling is. It is a growing field. Um, I'm not a doctor. I always clarify that for people. It's a mass, I'm a master's trained professional. And there's a lot of programs that are, a lot of new programs that are growing up, but that are growing and that are, you know, becoming accredited. So I really think it's a field people can look into. And I always thank you and Jonathan for having me on these hood medicine chats because I feel like even just me talking about genetic counseling on these chats is a way to get to, to get the word out. So I always thank you too for having me on.
Well, uh, and you're you're muted. Uh, yeah, I am muted. I said, and John. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think, John? <laughs> well, um, I, I want to answer your question, but before I get to that, I still yeah. want to underscore the problem that we have, and I I, I want to go back to the issue of death and dying because we really don't have a sense of what's impacting us. We, we really, and, and part of that is that um, we, don't, we don't have the information available to us. It's very difficult to get, our, get a handle on our morbidity and mortality data. It's incomplete. Even the COVID deaths are grossly underreported, mm -hmm. right? So um, let, me, let me start by just simply saying that um, when we talk about excess death, the impact of that is unimaginable. We, 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 we can barely comprehend what we're dealing with because we don't understand the full nature of the problem. So let's just talk in terms of the 20th century. From 1900 to 1999, an estimated 7.7 .7 excess African-American deaths occurred. Seven million people died who would have lived had they received equitable, uh, had their experience in this society been equal. Equal access to healthcare, education, good housing, et cetera, et cetera. Seven million people in that, in that century. That's probably an underestimate because as I've already said, we didn't have Medicare or Medicaid until the 1960s. So that number is probably a little bit skewed. But, but what does that number mean in context? So let me, uh, I, I'm shuffling through my paper here because I want to talk about uh, what, what that impact is. So um, in terms of death, we are, uh, more than twice as likely to lose a spouse by age 60, uh, four times more likely to lose a child. Uh, oh. When respondents in this particular study were between the ages of 50 and 80, they were four times more likely to lose a child. These are adults who oh. have probably grandchildren, right? Okay. Um, so, um, you know, this, this is, uh, at, at black adults are 2.5 times as likely as whites, more than 2.5 times likely as white adults to lose a child by age 30, all right? Grief and bereavement, they're a multiplier. So it's estimated that for every death, there are nine people that are affected by that. So when we look at that 7.9 in the, in the 20th century, 7.9 million people who just in that category of excess deaths, premature deaths, not even talking about deaths in general, multiply that out by the nine times nine. And you're looking at bereavement. Now, when you, when you look at this as a cumulative thing, it creates conditions in our community where people are constantly grieving. This is stressful. This is, and, and we add in the other multiplier, which is police violence and policing. That becomes another factor in the day-to-day -day stress that African-Americans experience. You have now black folks afraid to get behind the wheel of a car to drive to the grocery store, wondering if they're going to be able to come home a lot, you know, be able to get home as we go to their encounters with the police. So we, we, part of my answering your question is that we are still struggling to define the conditions in which we're having to uh, struggle and exist on a daily basis. That's number one. So what I'm really concerned about and what I'm engaged in is making sure we teach people about the social construction of race so people understand that race has a history. It is not innate to human beings. It's not biological. It's not driven by evolution. It was something that was invented by people at a particular time and place. We can name them. We can invent, we can dis discuss their inventions and its, its constituent parts. So that's number one. That has to be not only taught in med school, but taught to society in general. The other thing is we have to think about what are the fundamental causes of disease in our society? Granted, there are genetic diseases. There are hereditary, hereditary diseases that are passed down. But, but we, we um, have a host of other diseases that do not fall in that category. And we need to talk about why they occur. Why do we see cancers and heart disease and lung disease and kidney disease, et cetera, et cetera, what we call chronic illnesses? Where, they, where do they come from? So we need to be very clear. The fundamental causes of disease are socioeconomically based. We know as people's income levels rise, generally speaking, they have better access to healthcare. As their educational level rise, 
they have a greater understanding of the need for uh, proper health care, routine care, better diet and nutrition, exercise, et cetera, et cetera. These factors are all linked together and they need to be discussed. There's um, also, in my, from my approach, in dealing with the fundamental causes, there are two things that we really must hone in on. And that's, they're both, I would ground them both in environmental racism, right? Those two things are redlining, which is a phenomenon where we associate with residential segregation. And the other is a new term that I just learned called blue lining. And that is the use of the police to draw a line around those communities and occupy those communities as if they're wow. occupying a foreign colony. So the combination of blue lining and red lining is killing black people, causing excess deaths and, and, and at a pandemic epidemic level every year where we're looking at 70, 75,000 people dying who would be alive otherwise. Why are they dying? Residential segregation is a major factor in that, lack of access to uh, healthcare, uh, lack of access to grocery stores, et cetera, et cetera, and blue lining. The police departments, and you've been hearing about abolish the police, et cetera. The police were not created to prevent crime. The police were created to police communities, to control communities for the, for the advantage of the corporate and wealthy elite. That's been their whole purpose. Think about it in, just in reference to women. If the police were about preventing crime or even solving crime, <laughs> why, why in the world will we have thousands, I'm talking about tens of thousands of rape kits sitting in uh, yeah. laboratories untested, untested. Yeah, because, well, for one thing, because just like racism, um, rape and sexual assault is pretty much, you know, in the eyes of the beholder in our society, so. Well, it's also something that you would think there would be a police response to because it affects right. all women, but it is not because that's not what the police do. The police are not there. The police to do catch that. slaves. That's what the police were made to do. That's to what they were. That's, that's what they were uh, created for. That's what yeah. they still do. Yeah. That's correct. That's why. And the fact is, let's be very, very clear and very blunt. The idea of a free black person is an anathema to white supremacy. The fact is, every African American is regarded as a fugitive from the plantation. Which is why we can be accosted by police and. Uh, killed driving while black, walking while black, breathing while black, taking out the garbage while black, because we are viewed as unfree. Regardless, we do not have the same social status, social freedom, social liberty, momentum, whatever you want to call it, as others do. And that's true for other brown people as well. So free, the idea of a free black person is an anathema to white supremacy. And that is why we are subjected to this regime that, uh, that continues to exploit us, oppress us, and murder us. Yes, thank you for that, because honestly... <laughs> that was a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> so many need to hear it. Um, yeah. As we said earlier, we, this could... <laughs> We could have three, four, five hours of this. Um, yes. Thank our audience for tuning in and staying with us uh, for our lengthened uh, hood met chat. But I also want to thank, especially um, Jen Mohammed and John Chanel. You guys have provided some gems for us today um, around the topics of medical racism and you know how far we've come and how far we we still have to go before we can reach an equitable society. Um, so I want to thank you for, for coming out with us. Um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this discussion. Uh, at Hood Medicine, we want to bring you trusted individuals like John and Jen to provide you with facts and information to allow you to make the decisions necessary to keep you and your family safe. Um, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to support our effort, donate to our cause, and find out about our next events. You can visit hoodmedicine.org at hood underscore medicine on Instagram and Twitter or Hood Medicine Initiative, one word on Facebook. Thank you again. And uh, please mask up and get vaccinated. All right.